We're going to get started now. So on behalf of um, Imperial College Christian Union, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's lecture. And um, I'd also like to welcome everyone joining us live on the internet. This um, event is being streamed on the internet, so welcome to all of you. Um, the room is quite full in here. Um, I think I should probably point out we've got exits at the front and the back. And just beware of any trailing cables. Um, we're very privileged uh, to have with us this afternoon uh, Dr. Bill Craig, William Lane Craig, sorry. Uh, he's a renowned philosopher who is in England for just 10 days. He's touring, um, debating, and lecturing around the area. Um, William Lane Craig did his PhD in philosophy in England, and then he completed a doctorate in theology in Germany. Um, this double doctorate has equipped him to become one of the world's leading defenders of historic Christianity, and he has a particular interest in the philosophy of science, and has published more than 30 books and around 200 academic papers. His most recent book is On Guard, and that's on sale today and on the internet. And in this book, he goes through some of the arguments and explains them and expands them, like he's going to be doing today, but in a more thorough fashion. Um, his, his kind of key work is called Reasonable Faith, um, and that is also on sale today and on the internet, and that's kind of the book that he... Um, is most well known for. Uh, he's debated many contemporary atheists, including Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, Peter Atkins, and most recently, Stephen Law. Uh, much of his public work, and the topic of most of his debates, is uh, the evidence for the existence of God. Um, normally, in his debates, he only has kind of half an hour, 20 minutes to present his arguments, so we've asked him to come talk to us today on those arguments and to expand those arguments for them so that we can evaluate them for ourselves and decide where we stand on the issues. Um, I realize that people have got lectures at two, so um, some people might have lectures at two, so we're going to start very promptly now, and we're going to finish um, at 1.45, so that you've got time to go away for lectures. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor William Lane Craig to come talk to us about the evidence for the existence of God. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I am delighted uh, to have the invitation to speak on the evidence for God here at Imperial College, and thank you for coming. As a springboard for our discussion today, I'd like you to ask yourselves the question, is the material world all there is? The view that there's nothing apart from the material world goes by a number of different names. Materialism, uh, physicalism, naturalism would be a few. David Armstrong, a prominent naturalist philosopher, characterizes naturalism in the following way. Naturalism is the doctrine that reality consists of nothing but a single, all-embracing, spatio-temporal system. According to this view, then, all that exists is the contents of time and space. And the question, then, before us is, is that true? Is there nothing but the physical objects existing in time and space? Well, today I want to look at some reasons that suggest that this is not the case. I believe that there are certain aspects of reality that we encounter in our experience of the world that serve, as it were, as signposts of transcendence, pointing beyond the natural world to its ground in a transcendent reality. And apart from some overriding reason to think that naturalism is true, I think we've got to be open to the existence of such a transcendent reality. We can't justifiably close our minds in advance to the existence of such a transcendent reality. As Hamlet put it, there may be more things in heaven and on earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And today I want to sketch briefly seven aspects of the world which I think suggest that there are indeed more things in heaven and on earth than are dreamt of in naturalistic philosophy. Now whole books have been written on each of these, so what I'll present is a brief summary of each argument. Number one then, why anything at all exists. This is the deepest question of philosophy. Why is there something rather than nothing? This mystery, which according to Aristotle lay at the very root of philosophy, 
is one which even thoughtful naturalists cannot avoid. Derek Parfit, for example, agrees, and I quote, no question is more sublime than why there is a universe, why there is anything rather than nothing. Now, experience teaches that everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. This principle seems quite plausible, at least more so than it's contradictory. Imagine that you were walking through the woods and you found a translucent ball lying on the forest floor. You would find the claim quite bizarre that the ball exists there with literally no explanation. And merely increasing the size of the ball, even until it becomes coextensive with the cosmos, would do nothing to eliminate the need for or to provide an explanation of its existence. According to this first principle, then, everything that exists is one of either two types. The first type is anything that exists necessarily by its own nature. Examples? Well, many mathematicians believe that numbers, sets, and other abstract objects exist in this way. If such entities exist, they just exist necessarily, without any cause of their being. The other type is anything that has an external cause of its existence. Examples? Well, mountains, planets, people, galaxies, they have causes outside themselves which explain why they exist. Now, it's obvious that the universe exists. It therefore follows logically that the universe has an explanation of its existence. So, what sort of explanation could the universe have? Well, it seems plausible that three, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is an external, transcendent, personal cause. Why? Because the cause of the universe must be greater than the universe. Think of the universe, all of space and time. So the cause of the universe must be beyond space and time. Therefore, it cannot be physical or material. Now, there are only two kinds of things that could possibly fit that description. Either an abstract object, like a number, or else an intelligent mind. That is to say, an unembodied consciousness. But abstract objects can't cause anything. Uh, the number seven, for example, has no effect upon anything. And therefore, it follows that four, the explanation of the uh, universe is an external, transcendent, personal cause. That is to say, there exists an unembodied mind which created the universe, which is what most people have traditionally meant by the word God. So it seems to me that this is a sound argument for thinking that the explanation of why anything at all exists is to be found in a personal, transcendent mind which is necessary in its existence and which is the cause of the contingent universe. Number two, the origin of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Was there a beginning to the universe? Or does it just go back and back forever? Typically, naturalists have said that the universe is just eternal and uncaused, and that's all. But there are good reasons, both philosophical and scientific, to doubt that this is the case. Philosophically, the idea of an infinite past is very problematic. Think about it. If the universe never had a beginning, that means that the number of past events in the history of the universe is infinite. But the existence of an actually infinite number of things leads to metaphysical absurdities. To give one example, what is infinity minus infinity? Well, mathematically, you get self-contradictory answers. 
For example, if you had an infinite number of coins, numbered one, two, three, and so on, to infinity, and I took away all the odd-numbered coins, how many coins would you have left? Well, you'd still have all the even-numbered coins, right? Or an infinity of coins. So infinity minus infinity is infinity. But now suppose instead that I took away all of the coins numbered greater than three. Now how many coins would you have left? Well, just three. So infinity minus infinity is three. And yet in each case, I took away an identical number of coins from an identical number of coins and came up with contradictory results. In fact, you can get any answer when you subtract infinity from infinity from zero to infinity. And for that reason, inverse operations like subtraction and division are simply prohibited in transfinite arithmetic. But that convention doesn't apply to the real world. You can give away whatever coins you want. This shows, I think, that infinity is just a concept or an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. David Hilbert, who was perhaps the greatest mathematician of the 20th century, states, and I quote, the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. But that entails that since past events are not just ideas in your mind but are real, the number of past events must be finite. Therefore, the series of past events can't go back and back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. This purely philosophical conclusion has been confirmed by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. In one of the most startling developments of modern science, we now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning a finite time ago. For all matter and energy, even physical space and time themselves, came into being at a point in the finite past. As the physicist PCW Davies says, the coming into being of the universe as discussed in modern science is not just a matter of imposing some sort of organization upon a previous incoherent state, but literally the coming into being of all physical things from nothing. Now, of course, alternative theories have been proposed over the years to try to avoid this absolute beginning. But none of these theories has commended itself to the majority of the scientific community. In fact, in the year 2003, three cosmologists, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin, were able to prove that any universe, which is on average in a state of cosmic expansion throughout its history, cannot be eternal in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. This uh, theorem applies not only to the standard model, but also to semi-classical quantum gravity models, inflationary models of the universe, and higher dimensional brain cosmologies. Vilenkin pulls no punches. He writes, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, he says, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning." End quote. That problem was nicely captured by Anthony Kenny of Oxford University when he wrote, a proponent of the Big Bang Theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But surely that doesn't make sense. For such a conclusion is, in the words of the philosopher of science, Bernhard Kanitscheider, in head-on collision 
with the most successful ontological commitment in the history of science, namely the metaphysical principle that out of nothing, nothing comes. So why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? Where did it come from? There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. We can summarize the argument thus far as follows. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Given the truth of the two premises, the conclusion necessarily follows. Now, what sort of cause is this? Well, from the very nature of the case, this cause must be an uncaused, changeless, timeless, and immaterial being which created the universe. It must be uncaused because we've seen there cannot be an infinite regress of causes. So we must come to an absolutely first uncaused cause. It must be timeless and therefore changeless, at least without the universe, because it created time. Because it also created space, it must transcend space as well, and therefore be immaterial, not physical. Moreover, I would argue this cause must also plausibly be personal. For ask yourself, how else could a timeless cause give rise to a temporal effect with a beginning, like the universe? If the cause were just a mechanically operating set of necessary and sufficient conditions, then the cause could never exist without its effect. Once the sufficient conditions are given, then the effect must be given as well. For example, um, suppose the cause of water's freezing is the temperatures being below zero degrees centigrade. If the temperature were below zero degrees from eternity past, then any water that was around would be frozen from eternity. It would be impossible for the water just to begin to freeze a finite time ago. So if the cause is permanently present, its effect must be permanently present as well. The only way for the cause to be timeless and for its effect to begin a finite time ago is for the cause to be a personal agent endowed with freedom of the will and who therefore has the ability to spontaneously create a new effect without any antecedent determining conditions. For example, a man who has been sitting from eternity could freely will to stand up, and thus we would have an effect with a beginning arise from an eternal cause. And thus we're brought not merely to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. Number three. The fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. During the last 50 years or so, scientists have discovered that the existence of intelligent life depends upon a complex and delicate balance of initial conditions which are simply given in the Big Bang itself. Scientists once thought that whatever the initial conditions of the universe might have been, eventually life like ours might evolve somewhere in the cosmos. But we now know that intelligent life is in fact balanced on a knife's edge of incomprehensible fineness. The existence of intelligent life anywhere in the cosmos depends upon a conspiracy of initial conditions simply given in the Big Bang itself, which must be fine-tuned to a degree that is literally incomprehensible and incalculable. This fine-tuning is of two sorts. First, when the laws of nature are expressed as mathematical equations, you find appearing in them certain constants, like the gravitational constant. These constants are not determined by the laws of nature. The laws of nature are consistent with a wide range of values for these constants. Second, in addition to these constants, there are certain arbitrary quantities which are just put in as initial conditions on which the laws of nature operate. For example, the amount of entropy 
in the early universe. Now, all of these constants and quantities fall into an extraordinarily narrow range of life-permitting values. Were these constants and quantities to be altered by less than a hair's breadth, the balance would be destroyed and life would not exist. Now, there are only three possibilities for explaining the presence of this remarkable fine-tuning of the universe. The fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. The first alternative holds that there's some unknown theory of everything, or toe, that would explain the way the universe is. It had to be that way. And there was really no chance, or little chance, of the universe's not being life-permitting. By contrast, the second alternative states that the fine-tuning is due entirely to chance. It's just an accident that the universe is life-permitting, and we're the lucky beneficiaries. The third alternative rejects both of these explanations in favor of an intelligent mind behind the cosmos who designed the universe to permit life. And the question is, which of these alternatives is the most plausible? Well, the first alternative, physical necessity, seems extraordinarily implausible because, as we've seen, the constants and quantities are independent of the laws of nature. The laws of nature are consistent with a wide range of values for these constants and quantities. For example, the most promising candidate for a toe today, uh, super string theory or M theory, allows for a cosmic landscape of around 10 to the 500 power different possible universes governed by the present laws of nature. So that it does nothing to explain the observed values of the constants and quantities and to render them physically necessary. So what about the second alternative, that the fine-tuning of the universe is due to chance? Well, the problem with this alternative is that the odds against the universe's being life-permitting are so incomprehensibly great that they cannot be reasonably faced. Even though there will be a large number of life-permitting universes lying within the cosmic landscape, nevertheless, the proportion of life-permitting worlds will be so unfathomably tiny compared to the landscape as a whole that a dart thrown randomly at the cosmic landscape would have no meaningful chance of striking a life-permitting world. So, in order to rescue the hypothesis of chance, its proponents have therefore been forced to adopt the extraordinary hypothesis that there exists an infinite number of randomly ordered parallel universes, undetectable by us, composing a sort of world ensemble or multiverse uh, in which finely tuned universes will appear simply by chance alone. And we happen to be in one such world. There are, however, at least two major failings with the world ensemble hypothesis. First, there's no evidence that such a world ensemble exists. No one knows if there are other universes at all, much less that they are randomly ordered and infinite in number. Moreover, recall that uh, Borg, Guth, and Vilenkin prove that any universe which is in a state of continuous cosmic expansion cannot be infinite in the past. Their theorem applies to the multiverse as well. Therefore, since its past is finite, only a finite number of universes may have been generated by now. So there's no guarantee at all that a finely tuned universe will have appeared anywhere in the ensemble. Secondly, and more fundamentally, if our universe is just a random member of an infinite world ensemble, then it's overwhelmingly more probable that we should be observing a much different universe than what we in fact observe. Roger Penrose has calculated that it is inconceivably more probable 
that our solar system should suddenly form in an instant through the random collision of particles than that a finely tuned universe should exist. In fact, Penrose calls it utter chicken feed by comparison. So, if our universe were just a random member of a world ensemble, it is in, in, inconceivably more probable that we should be observing an island of order no larger than our solar system. For there are far more observable universes in the world ensemble in which our solar system comes to be instantaneously through the accidental collision of particles than universes which are finely tuned for the existence of uh, embodied observers like ourselves. Or again, if the universe were just a random member of a world ensemble, then we ought to be observing highly extraordinary events like horses popping into and going out of being through the random collision of particles, since such things are vastly more probable than the existence of a finely tuned universe, of all of nature's constants and quantities falling by chance alone into the infinitesimal life-permitting range. Observable universes like those with the horses popping in and out of being are vastly more plenteous in the world uh, ensemble than ours and therefore ought to be observed by us. And since we do not have such observations, Penrose argues, that fact strongly disconfirms the world ensemble hypothesis. On naturalism, at least, therefore, I think it is highly improbable that such a world ensemble exists. It seems then, premise two, that the fine-tuning is not due to physical necessity or chance from which it follows logically, therefore it is due to design. And thus this argument gives us a cosmic designer of the universe. Number four, objective moral values and duties in the world. If naturalism is true, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. Now, to say that there are objective moral values is to say that something is good or evil, right or wrong, independently of whether people believe in it or not. It's to say, for example, that Nazi anti-Semitism was wrong, even though the Nazis who carried out the Holocaust thought that it was right. And it would still have been wrong, even if the Nazis had won World War II and succeeded in exterminating or brainwashing everyone who disagreed with them so that everyone thought that the Holocaust was right. And the claim is that in the absence of God, moral values and duties are not objective in that sense. So, premise one, if God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. Many theists and atheists alike concur on this point. For example, the late J. L. Mackey of Oxford University, one of the most influential atheist philosophers of our time, admitted, and I quote, if there are objective values, they make the existence of a God more probable than it would have been without them. Thus we have a defensible argument from morality to the existence of a God. But instead of inferring to God's existence, Mackey chose instead to deny that objective moral values exist. He wrote, it is easy to explain this moral sense as a natural product of biological and social evolution. Michael Roos, who is an agnostic philosopher of science, agrees. He explains, and I quote, morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth, considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself. They think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory." End quote. 
Friedrich Nietzsche, the great 19th century atheist who proclaimed the death of God, understood that the death of God meant the destruction of all meaning and value in life. I think that Friedrich Nietzsche was right. But we've got to be very careful here. The question here is not, must we believe in God in order to live moral lives? I'm not claiming that we must. Nor is the question, can we recognize objective moral values without believing in God? I certainly think that we can. Rather, the question is, if God does not exist, do objective moral values and duties exist? And like Mackey and Roos, I honestly don't see any reason to think that in the absence of God, human morality is objective. After all, given a naturalistic view, what's so special about human beings? They're just accidental byproducts of nature, which have evolved relatively recently on an infinitesimal speck of dust called the planet Earth, lost somewhere in a hostile and mindless universe in which are doomed to perish individually and collectively in a relatively short time. On the naturalistic view, some actions, say rape, may not be socially advantageous. And so in the course of human development, it's become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that rape is wrong. Such behavior goes on all the time in the animal kingdom. On the naturalistic view, there's nothing really wrong with raping someone. And thus, without God, there is no absolute right and wrong which imposes itself on our conscience. But the problem is, premise two, objective moral values and duties do exist. In moral experience, we apprehend a realm of objective moral values and duties which impose themselves upon us. There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. The reasoning of Michael Roos at best proves that our subjective perception of moral values has evolved. But if moral values are gradually discovered rather than invented, then our gradual and fallible perception of the moral realm no more undermines the objectivity of that realm than our gradual and fallible perception of the physical world undermines the objectivity of that realm. Most of us recognize, I think, that in moral experience we do apprehend objective moral values and duties. Roos himself confesses in another context, and I quote, the man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Some things at least are really wrong. Similarly, love, equality, tolerance, self-sacrifice are really good. But if objective values and duties cannot exist without God, and objective moral values and duties do exist, then it follows logically and inescapably that three, therefore, God exists. And thus, I think we have good moral grounds for affirming the existence of God. Number five, the possibility of God's existence. I've rarely shared this argument in a public lecture, not because I think it's unsound, but because it's so abstract that students are apt to either uh, think it's a trick or not to understand it. But I'm going to uh, go out on a limb and share it with you this afternoon. Now, in order to understand this argument, you need to understand what philosophers mean by possible worlds. A possible world is just a way the world might have been. It's a complete description of reality. So a possible world is not a planet or a universe or any kind of concrete object. It's just a world description. The actual world is the description that is true. Other possible worlds are descriptions that are not in fact true, but which might have been true. 
To say that something exists in some possible world is to say that there is some possible description of reality which includes that entity in the description. To say that something exists in every possible world means that no matter which description is true, the entity will be included in the description. For example, unicorns do not in fact exist, but there is some possible world in which unicorns exist. On the other hand, many mathematicians think that mathematical objects like numbers exist in every possible world. Now, with that in mind, consider the ontological argument, which was discovered in the year 1011 by the monk Anselm of Canterbury. God, Anselm observes, is by definition the greatest being conceivable. If you could conceive of anything greater than God, then that would be God. So the very concept of God is of the greatest conceivable being, a maximally great being. So what would such a being be like? Well, he would be all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, and he would exist in every logically possible world. A being which lacked any of those properties would not be maximally great. We could conceive of something greater. But what that implies is that if God's existence is even possible, then it follows that God must exist. For if a maximally great being exists in any possible world, he exists in all of them. That's part of what it means to be maximally great, to be all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good in every logically possible world. So if God's existence is even possible, then he exists in every logically possible world, and therefore in the actual world. We can summarize this argument as follows. Premise one, it's possible that a maximally great being, a.k.a. God, exists. Two, if it is possible that a maximally great being exists, then a maximally great being exists in some possible world. Three, if a maximally great being exists in some possible world, then it exists in every possible world. Four, if a maximally great being exists in every possible world, then it exists in the actual world. Five, therefore, a maximally great being exists in the actual world. Six, therefore, a maximally great being exists. Seven, therefore, God exists. Now, it might surprise you to learn that steps two to seven of this argument are relatively uncontroversial. Most philosophers by far would agree that if God's existence is even possible, then he must exist. So the whole question is premise one. Is God's existence possible? Well, what do you think? The atheist has to maintain that it's impossible that God exists. He has to say that the concept of God is incoherent, like the concept of a married bachelor or a square circle. But the problem is that the concept of God just doesn't seem to be incoherent in that way. The idea of a being which is all-powerful, all-good, and all-knowing in every logically possible world seems to be perfectly coherent. Moreover, as we've already seen, there are other arguments for God's existence which at least suggest that it's possible that God exists. So I'll simply leave it with you this afternoon. Do you think, as I do, that it's possible that God exists? If so, then it follows logically that he does exist. Number six, the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was by all accounts a remarkable individual. New Testament historians have reached something of a consensus that the historical Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, with the claim to stand and speak in the place of God himself. That's why the Jewish leadership 
instigated his crucifixion on the charge of blasphemy. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come. And as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of exorcisms and miracle working. But certainly the supreme confirmation of his claim was his alleged resurrection from the dead. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands, and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, most people would probably think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just believe in, by faith or not. But in fact, there are actually three established facts which are recognized by the majority of New Testament historians today, which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. The empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of his disciples' belief in his resurrection. Let me say just a very brief word about each of these. Fact number one. Jesus' tomb was in fact discovered empty by a group of his women followers on the Sunday morning after the crucifixion. According to Jakob Kramer, who is uh, an Austrian specialist in this area, and I quote, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. According to D.H. Van Dalen, it is extremely difficult to object to the empty tomb on historical grounds. Those who deny it, he says, do so on the basis of theological or philosophical assumptions. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to Gerhard Ludemann, a prominent German New Testament critic, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by skeptics, unbelievers, and even enemies of the early Christian movement. Fact number three, the original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite every predisposition to the contrary. Think of the situation that the disciples faced following Jesus' crucifixion. Number one, their leader was dead. And Jewish messianic expectations included no idea of a Messiah who instead of triumphing over Israel's enemies would be shamefully executed by them as a criminal. Secondly, Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the general resurrection at the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples suddenly came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. Luke Johnson, who is a New Testament scholar at Emory University, states some sort of powerful, transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. And N.T. Wright, who is an eminent British scholar, concludes, that is why, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Attempts to explain away these three great facts, like the disciples stole the body or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is that there just is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these facts. And therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. But that entails that God exists. And we can summarize this argument as follows. Number one, there are three established facts concerning Jesus of Nazareth. The discovery of his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the very origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. Two, the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead is the best explanation of these facts. Three, 
the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead entails that the God revealed by Jesus of Nazareth exists uh, for, therefore, the God revealed by Jesus of Nazareth exists. And thus we have a good inductive argument for the existence of the God of Israel who was proclaimed and revealed by Jesus of Nazareth. Finally, number seven, the personal experience of God. Now this seventh point isn't really an argument for God's existence. Rather, it's the claim that you can know that God exists wholly apart from arguments, simply by personally experiencing him. This was the way that people in the Bible knew God. As Professor John Hick of Birmingham University explains, and I quote, God was known to them as a dynamic will interacting with their own wills, a sheer given reality, as inescapably to be reckoned with as destructive storm and life-giving sunshine. They did not think of God as an inferred entity, but as an experienced reality. To them, God was not an idea adopted by the mind, but an experienced reality which gave significance to their lives. Philosophers call beliefs like this properly basic beliefs. They aren't based on some other beliefs. Rather, they're part of the foundations of a person's system of beliefs. Other properly basic beliefs would include things like belief in the reality of the past, the existence of the external world, and the presence of other minds like your own. When you think about it, none of these beliefs can be proved. How can you prove that the world was not created five minutes ago with built-in appearances of age, like a food in our stomachs from the breakfast we never really ate, or memory traces in our brains of events we never really experienced? How can you prove that you're not a brain in a vat, uh, being stimulated with electrodes by a mad scientist to believe that you're studying here at Imperial College and listening to this lecture right now? How can you prove that the people sitting around you are not really androids who exhibit all of the external behavior of persons with an interior life, but in reality they're just soulless, robot-like entities? Well, although these beliefs are simply basic for us, that doesn't mean that they're arbitrary. Rather, they're grounded in the sense that they are formed in the context of certain experiences. In the experiential context of seeing and feeling and hearing things, I naturally form the belief that there's a world of physical objects around me. And thus, my basic beliefs are not arbitrary, but they're grounded in experience. There may be no way to prove such beliefs, but it's perfectly rational to hold them. In fact, you'd have to be crazy to think that you were really a brain in a vat, or that the world was created five minutes ago. Such beliefs are not merely basic, they are properly basic. Now, in exactly the same way, God is, for those who know him personally, a basic belief which is grounded in our experience of God. And we can summarize this consideration as follows. One, beliefs which are appropriately grounded may be rationally accepted as basic beliefs, not grounded on argument. Two, belief that the biblical God exists is appropriately grounded. Three, therefore, belief that the biblical God exists may be rationally accepted as a basic belief, not grounded on argument. Now, if this is right, then there's a danger that arguments for the existence of God could actually distract one's attention from God himself. We could become so focused on the external arguments that we fail to hear the inner voice of God speaking to our own hearts. The Bible says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We mustn't so concentrate on the external proofs that we fail to hear the voice of God speaking to our own hearts. For those who do listen, God can become a personal reality in their lives. So, in summary, we've seen seven features of the world around us that point beyond the world 
to its ground in a transcendent reality. Number one, why anything at all exists. Number two, the origin of the universe. Number three, the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. Number four, the existence of objective moral values and duties in the world. Number five, the very possibility of God's existence. Number six, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And number seven, the immediate personal experience of God. Is the material world all there is? Well, I think on the basis of the seven reasons that I presented, we have a powerful cumulative case for thinking that the answer is no.